Uh, hello, good evening. Um, thank you for coming to the Almeida. I'm, I'm Rob, I'm the Associate Director here, and I'm thrilled to welcome to the Almeida stage uh, Katie Mitchell, who really needs no introduction because look, there's lots of people here, who is, I think, probably the most important director that Britain's produced in the last like, memorable time, and, and no better person to have a chat with about Chekhov, which is what we're here to have a chat about. So we're going we're gonna to sort of have a chat for a bit, and then... You can ask us some questions, if that's all right. Um, Should we take our lights down a bit and make them a little less bright? What do you think? Is I think that's like the most brilliantly Katie Mitchell way to start. <laughs> <laughs> can we have less light? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like this at home, though. Are you? Yes. The nanny comes in, you know, my child's nanny. She has all the, the overhead lights, and, and I always go, oh, no, you just turn them off. It's just too bright. Can we just have some nice practical lights in the corner of the room? My daughter is so frustrated. They're not, going, they're, they're not dimmable. Maybe we have to keep them. They're going to be someone. Someone is going to sort that out for us. Yeah. Um, shall I just? Can I start by asking you a really? I mean, life is is sort of very short and very long. And I suppose as a director, you like one only has a certain number of writers you get to meet in a rehearsal room. You kind of can't do everything now because, given where we are in 2016, there's sort of just too many plays to do them all. Why Chekhov? Why was Chekhov one of the people you wanted to? bring into your body of water. Yeah, well, the, uh, I suppose I learned everything that I know about theatre from Russia and Poland. So um, for me, that check was sort of at, at the heart of, well, mainly Russian society. And uh, when I went to train there in 88-89, uh, uh, I had him there as an icon. I went to his house, tried to do the snow to his house. I went to parks that he walked in. And uh, I went in to the Moscow Art Theatre and sat there with you know, simultaneous Russian translation, or English translation going on, and watched uh, The Seagull. I watched, you know, big gun Russian directors like Yefremov direct The Cherry Orchard. So you know, it's like, it's sort of linked to everything that inspired me as a theatre maker. All the great practitioners like Lev Dodin, like Anatoly Vasiliev, like Juventus Necrosius, who big guns in the sort of 80s and early 90s in the Eastern European world were all directing Chekhov. Hmm. And um, it, it became a total fascination. I even went to Melikovo, you know, the, the house that he had, which is the big estate, but it's actually very small, it's like a bungalow. Really? Um, and I was always just loved the fact that he was a doctor and the fact that he was quite forensic mm -hmm. and not literary. <coughs> And uh, the fact that he was, you know, also a short story writer, which meant he was brilliant with the economy of everything that he would do in every scene. Um, but I think it all goes back to my love of Russia and all that I learned there about how to make theatre. But, but what about you? Why check off for you? It's a conversation. It can't just be one person. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I suppose I felt the same thing as you, which is it, it's one of, the, <coughs> one of the kind of hurdles you feel you have to try and jump as a director, because it, it's there, and, and exactly as you say, you're so aware of so many attempts to do it. I suppose, from, I mean, I've only done one, Uncle Vanya is the only one I've ever worked on, and you've done nearly all of them. Um, and I suppose for me, at this particular moment, having done one, and having not done any more than one, I, I've slightly fallen in love with him, I think, and, and, and with the, like, I, I found this play in the Rasa room particularly so revolutionary. It's brilliant. And so full of formal <coughs> ideas that I felt like we hadn't, I was reading modern plays <coughs> last week and yesterday, and I thought, yeah, they just need that note that he takes in, in the third act, or like, what they haven't worked out is the thing he does in the fourth act. And particularly, I, I still feel like I'm not on top of... I, we, have, we have this thing in the, in the advertising for this where, we, where there's a quote about, from Chekhov slagging off Ibsen and effectively saying, yeah, Ibsen is not how life is. Mm. And there's something about Ibsen's dramaturgy, for me, where you always kind of know what game you're playing. So there's usually one character who's going to go on this trajectory and there's a thing that's either got to happen or not happen and then it sort of explodes at the end and then that's the end. But you're, you're watching a cruise missile go towards where it's going. And with Chekhov, it's so not like that. It's almost it's unbelievable. That's right. It's really common. Cool. Directing the big scenes are killers, aren't they? When you've, got, when you've got more than two people in a Chekhov scene, you know, to analyse it and then present it accurately is breathtakingly difficult. Well, I became really aware in the big... I mean, I'm going to try and not do spoilers on Uncle Vanya in case anybody's seeing it tonight and is in the blissful position of not having read it or seen it before. But the big explosion in Vanya in the third act, 
I remember looking at them all one day up there and thinking, he set it up so that if you didn't know this play, any one of you could be the person who blows. Like, there's, there's really clear psychological setup on every single one of the principles, and any one of them could be the person who, who loses it and, and creates the explosion. And that's, I can't think of other playwrights that's true yeah, of. Yeah, it's just so wonderful, isn't it? But it's tricky, isn't it? Because I, I think that the reason that you and I may have that sense of the radicalism of the material um, and be surprised that no one else knows that is that maybe the sort of production history and traditions that sort of came into being around the 1970s got mixed up with the plays. Yes. So, uh, and that's why you can offend a lot of people oh, if yes. you do Chekhov as yes. radically as the material actually is, mm. is because everyone mixes up the um, productions that were done in the 1970s and 1980s with the material. That's quite tricky, but, but uh, you haven't had that experience. Oh, I have. Have people got angry? People have got angry. There's, there's regular on the show reports, there's a lot of harumphing and leaving. Oh, when did they um, harumph? It's good. It's good. It's, so some people say, I, I overheard actually an odd couple I was in in the first interval the other day, and um, a very angry woman was saying to Tina at the box office, nothing happens in it, just nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. It's kind of like, That's great. It's brilliant. It's amazing. But also, I, 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 I bet you've had the same experience. I've been really surprised when engaging with people talking about it, how much you get praised for things that are just his. So people kept, there's a few people said to me, I love those bits you've written in where they just talk to the audience. And I was like, they're definitely in the play. Like, they're, they're, they're just his. It's a line by line translation of his play. Um, but it feels to me like the, the performance history of Chekhov, in exactly the way you're describing, is, is a bit of a cocky cutter in that it takes a particular shape out of the play, but it ignores the vast canvas of what's actually going but on. I think that maybe also historically there's a huge difference between the, the sort of 19th century, late 19th century, early 20th century in Russia and here. And even though the sort of clothing is the same, what's going on historically is so radically different, isn't it? Mm. I mean, we're at the height of our sort of, you know, industrial luxury, la di da, we're running the world. And they're teetering on the brink of total destruction. Mm. And I think that that's also can be quite confusing for audiences who think of Chekhov as representing maybe Victorian England mm. as opposed to pre-revolutionary Russia. So different, and that, and that's I really think very tricky to get. I think it's great. All you you've done it with modern clothes. You see, mm. I started doing historical costumes, and I think retrospectively I shouldn't have done that. Then I tried to upgrade with the seagull into sort of loosening that, and then everyone thought I was. Oh, I misunderstood where the revolution was. Yeah. <laughs> oh. that, that was like a, a disaster. So I think maybe I should have just started modern clothing like you've done. But your, your cherry orchard was modern clothing. Uh, not a, sort of timeless um, modern. Yeah, timeless modern isn't modern, really, strictly. It, well, this is, this very, isn't modern modern in a sort of, there's no laptops. There's David Bowie. There's David, yeah, there is. <laughs> That's modern. That's modern. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he's the benchmark of modern. Yeah. Well, no, it doesn't, because I don't know anything about show tapes, you know, I don't get out enough. But, um, yes, it, it sounds like they're all, they're all like dressed like we're dressed, aren't they? I think, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's in a contemporary idiom. I suppose that's... I mean, I found, the, the reason I took that decision on this with, with Hildegard, who designed it, was because I really felt like the history in this one wasn't really in the recipe so much, in the way that with Cherry Orchard... Yeah. It, it is more, isn't it? It, it, it? it seems to be speaking more specifically, at least to me, to that particular mm. moment. But what do you do with that history? That is, is that a part of your rehearsal process? It, it was to begin with, because I suppose I did it over like 12 years. <laughs> Check on the <laughs> did all of them. Yeah. And uh, so to begin with, I would have been sort of, you know, because I'd been to all the places, I would have been very historically accurate. And then as time passed, I became more interested in the form and the radicalism of of the material and trying to accelerate that. So got less interested, much more sloppy with historical research and biographies, really shocking, shockingly sloppy. Um, what about you? How do you deal with that? Do, I suppose you do your own versions <coughs> and cut it all out, do you? I do a bit. Yeah, that's probably a very, very wise strategy. Scissors are always a great thing to apply to any material. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, how, how would you, if you had to go into Russell tomorrow on check off? What sort of process would you put the actors through now, knowing everything you know at the end of 12 years of doing all the check-ups? <laughs> I don't think I'd do another check-up. I said that to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, what would I do? 
I suppose we'd definitely um, not be very interested in historical things and probably would have scissored the text. I suppose I never scissored as much as I wanted to because I still wanted to be liked. Um, at some, that's a yeah. thing that you can't shed, you know, so I, I was finally always a little bit polite. But having been abroad now, where I'm not, uh, I don't have the need to be polite any longer <coughs> here, and, and this isn't where I work. Yeah. So it's like a holiday kind of hit. <laughs> so I would, be, uh, I would cut it uh, very radically and uh, cast it very unexpectedly and very unromantically. Same old, same old. Mm -hmm. What does unexpected and unromantic mean? Um, maybe people who aren't beautiful, and maybe people who aren't famous. Mm. Um, <coughs> maybe, maybe do that. But other than that, I don't know. I don't think I have an appetite any longer. I mean, it's so wonderful meeting you, because you're like at the beginning, and I think Vanny was the second one, or I think it was the first one I did. Mm. I think Vanny is like the door into chapter mm. You know, so I did it with Stephen Delaney, you know, mm. the young Vic in, I can't remember which year it was. So you're right at the beginning of this amazing journey, because he's addicted. Mm. Chekhov's addicted, because it's <coughs> sort of undoable. It is. You can't do it. It's better to read. <laughs> <laughs> it's so difficult to do. And yet I'm at the end, but being a bit sort of, you know, a bit, a bit weary. I didn't do a very good cherry orchard as well, so I feel I, I disappointed myself. That's the one I'd always wanted to do. Mm. Um, everything I'd made was a rehearsal to do, so I didn't do it very well. So that was a bit disappointing. But you could do it again. Yes, yes. I think I've got other things to do. <laughs> um, I think I learnt a lot by doing by doing Chekhov. You know, a huge, huge amount. You know, and I, I look back really fondly on all of those in that body of work. Mm. Which would be the next one you would do? <coughs> I mean, I sort of, I, a bit like you, I, I love Cherry Orchard, but I've, I, I find it difficult. I find it, I don't quite know how to, di I've never known quite how to attack it. Mm. It feels like a very well defended castle, and I'm not sure what the way in is. Um, and, I mean, this is bad, I find Three Sisters a mildly annoying play. <laughs> like, in, in performance a lot, I'm, I'm, I always find it a little bit. You don't have the other two sisters. Well, Smash it, it the just other two. It, what, what I love about Vanya is it feels so structurally balanced that every time he sort of moves the camera, you're ready for the camera to move. And I think that the the rhythm, the scenic rhythm of it is so extraordinary. And the way he achieves, which you know anyone who's ever tried to write anything, including an essay, knows how hard it is to get one thing to flow into the next thing. And these are four perfect real time acts in which. The motivation for everybody coming and going. He really loves. It's it's completely <laughs> in a minister, isn't it? It's, no, it's breathtaking. And, and at any point when the actors say, "Why am I coming in now?" or "Why would I do that?" it's always there to find. Mm -hmm. So like, the process we went through on Vanya, for a lot of it was just digging the, the sort of treasure out of the ground in terms of what's gone on in that play before it started. How do we all know each other? What is that about? What is that about? But do you think if I'm a bit, maybe a bit cheap? Please. Um, do you think that the reason that you find the three sisters boring is a gender thing? That's a good question. Um. <laughs> it's inter I, I don't think it is, because I don't find it as boring as I find the work of Harold Pinter, who is nearly all about men. Um, and I think, I think it's a formal thing. Yeah, I think yeah. it's, it's the fire I don't like. That's always where I go. It, it's just, it's very hard to direct because it's very easy to direct the one, the version of Three Sisters, which is called Masha. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so it's very hard to direct the one in which every time one of the three comes on, it's equally interesting. I think I, I'm not sure whether I actually achieved that. I'm sorry that I didn't mean to be impolite no, it's in that question. But, <laughs> but I feel accountable as a senior female artist <laughs> for the feminist agenda. So forgive me for that. I mean, I did. Um, I definitely had a personal connection because so I was definitely doing Uncle Vanya because it, it reminded me of my dad. Yeah. You know, so uh, I know the way that affinities play. Yeah.
consciously and unconsciously. Yeah. And our own private life plays consciously and unconsciously through the choices <coughs> we make as artists mm. about the work that we do. And part of part of that journey through is learning those things. That, that <coughs> you can't totally. Well, it was you think you're objective, but actually it's totally subjective, somewhere hidden that you would never declare to anyone. Well, and sometimes you don't even realise until one of your friends comes and says, that's just that, isn't it? And you think, oh, yeah. Because from a, a point of view of men, the play is really interesting because the male characters are really unexpected. All of them are, are mm. unexpected. Mm. And they're not quite like our tradition of blokes in plays like Hamlet and Shakespeare, which is so much dominating the way that we think about putting men on stage. Mm. But I think they're very, very curiously shaped, aren't they? The men really exquisite, exquisitely drawn. The women are trickier. You know, she's very, very hard, isn't she? The woman that they all project onto, what decision you make about who she actually is. Mm. If you can sort of scrape off the projection. And then the other, Sonia, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yes. She's very hard to do because of the religion. <coughs> and oh, sort of I, I said that. <laughs> you probably took that yeah, out. Yeah, I did. Yeah. All the sort of blind spots, they're, very, they're parked really strangely in the head. I mean, I always felt that the play, when, when I was working on making the version of the play, the reason it's called Uncle Vanya is to declare two leads. Mm -hmm. So it's both Vanya, but the person from, whom, from whose point of view the yeah. play sees him, which is Sonia. And of course, for that relationship to exist at all, for Sonia and Vanya to have a relationship that's Uncle Vanya, there's the other woman who joins them both together, mm -hmm. who's not in the play, but is very much in the play. So I suppose I always felt that, that this, I, I think he's quite conscious of the absence of mm -hmm. the, the successful uh, mother relationship in this play. There's a disastrous mother relationship that is in with the light brush brush, very, very clear. Um, and I, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a, w a weird question, I suppose, because you know what his own Chekhov's own strange, slightly toxic relationship with a lot of women in his life was. Mm -hmm. And you wonder how far that feeds into Elena as played by Olga Knipper. And that whole, again, his biography is on the table now, isn't it? I think it is. It's a, a, with the Rayfield biography became all yes. sort of sex stories, didn't it? But I, I, think there's a, I think there's only one really essential story Chekhov. It isn't to do with the sex stories, and a lot of sex stories actually, he's not getting an erection. Mm. That's the other thing to read. He's not particularly physically potent, and that <coughs> must go back to what he's 23, 24, they think, when he knows he's got TB. Mm. And I, I think that's a defining a sort of base note of the man. Mm. He knows he's going to die, and he knows because he's a doctor how he's going to die. And um, part of this sort of the women. I think connects to that. And then Olga, there she comes, into his life, very, very late on. He's definitely going to die. He knows he's going to die. Um, great love of his life. That must be painful. So I think, I always feel that it's the death mm. and illness strand of the writing that sort of that creates this awful, deep sadness, plus this amazing, unforgiving insight into human because each play could be the last one. Mm -hmm. He must have thought that yeah. at some level. So there's a sort of defining energy and attack on all of the material as well, because it could be the last one in the Testament. Hmm. Um, but that, doing the cherry orchard, coming back to it, you really feel this sort of this undertow, this sound undertow. Um, maybe, maybe you feel it a little bit in Sarah Kane as well, in a funny sort of way. We now we're talking about um, Chekhov. We just done her piece. Maybe there's the same sort of. It's like a rip tide, isn't it? It's very mm. dangerous to swim in a rip tide. You know, normal tides are pretty dangerous, don't you? A rip one, we've got cross currents coming in, <coughs> and you feel that's underneath the play. You know? mm. And there's also a sense, I suppose, in this play and um, in Cherry Orchard that the the natural world is going the same journey. That that's yes. not just on a character level. That's also that that's on the macro structure as well. And in this play, that this play is loaded up with imagery of, of effectively apocalypse. You know, when there's nothing left, when everything's gone. But you must gone. have felt it. Yeah. I mean, they, and they were right because everything was destroyed. I mean, just the level of destruction that that, that came within what 1905 would be the first. But when is Devil Vanya? Just before 1907. 97. Yeah. And by 1905, they got the first wave of the of the violence, and then yeah. very soon it's completely gone. Now. Of course, we 
we're, we're attracted to it because <coughs> we feel in the same sort of historical moment, don't we? We feel a sort of it's all about God. with the environmental yeah. and the, right. the sort of you know, the, the <coughs> that are going on in the East. So um, it, it's the it chimes, doesn't it? But it was a different, a different apocalypse, horrible apocalypse. Mm. How how funny do you find the place? Yeah, so I do do. That's just a constant, endless anal conversations about the time bond comedy. Yes. Oh, that means that it's got lots of jokes in it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and you just think, well, no, it's funny because human beings, when their pants are down and are doing embarrassing things, like falling in love with the wrong people and doing the things that you should never do, which is constantly asking to be loved back by them, <laughs> is just so funny. Yeah. <laughs> it's also because it's unbearable. Yeah. It's just so <laughs> upsetting. <laughs> Don't you think? I do. I don't think they're sort of, oh, I tell you an ironical joke. No. It's like because our pants are down and someone is watching it, you know, and it's awful. We're laughing because it's, t it's just embarrassing. That's what it should be, but maybe that's my, my reason. You know, no, I, I, I'm talking, I mean, I, sort of, I, I kept referencing um, the, the, fir the British version of The Office when we were rehearsing this mm -hmm. and saying not only does it feel like it for... Mm -hmm. But, and again, partly because they're so well structured, so they, they, I, I think they almost feel voyeuristic. Mm. And sometimes you feel like you're just like Big Brother or something. You're just watching it roll along. Um, but it, it is, I, sometimes I, I've I found, particularly in rehearsals, that, that when it felt like it, it, it hit, you didn't quite know whether you were prepared <coughs> to laugh mm. and, to, and to therefore make a judgment about the characters or to, to feel sad and therefore feel sentimental about the characters. And that actually all of them are both pathetic and profound yeah. and the, that alternating current but isn't that like us it's incredible yeah. and you think and i suppose i i got fed up like you were being asked is it a comedy yeah. and i started saying to people mildly aggressively is your life a comedy yeah, very and, and like <laughs> <laughs> wait, but then, yeah and you sort of think well that's that's his project his project is how do you get it to feel as much like real life as possible and 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 but I it wasn't a name, was it, that he could put on the play that existed because he was so radical. Yeah. So radical. There wasn't a name. So maybe just the wrong name went, went on, <laughs> I just think. There weren't the words to describe what he was inventing, which is a new form of theatre. That's right. And I suppose as well that they are. I mean, I, I, I try and. I mean, I don't, know, how do you, I, I don't know how you negotiate jokes in rehearsal rooms because I find them. What jokes? Like. Well, like when, there's, when, when actors say, but that's a joke, isn't it? My blood runs slightly cold. And you think, yeah. But because well, so much, I think, I, there's a thing called theatre funny, which is not really funny. But people <laughs> laugh in recognition of the idea that it's supposed to be funny. <laughs> so like, we all enter into this game where it, someone does a bad, non-convincing platform and the audience sort of obediently laugh. And you think, what are we all doing? Like, what is this for? Yeah. And, and, and I suppose that I try and call that in my head jokey rather than funny. Because funny is a thing you can't help but go, that's very funny. And I really enjoy it when he says in the third act, if I had a normal life, I could have been Dostoevsky, I could have been Schopenhauer. Oh, and people that's laugh. That's people that's laugh that's and then that's cut that's themselves that's off from laughing and then start laughing and no one quite knows what you're supposed to do. And you think, well, that's what it would be like if somebody said that in real life and said, you know what, I could have been Dostoevsky. And you'd go... <laughs> 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 <Okay>. <laughs> it's so moving, isn't it? But it's just it's a mechanical thing, isn't it? Which is that there are two mechanical things is that if the actor plays too high a percentage they're trying to get the laugh at its maximum, yeah. then it's less engaging the acting. That's right. And the whole, you think, oh, you sort of think, oh, we're on a stage, we're in a theatre, we're not in an imaginary place. And the second thing is, how long do you leave the pause for the laugh, you know? Mm. I insist now, <laughs> I'm just world weary with it, mm. that they just plough on. Really? And they always got laugh and then, oh, fuck, ooh, we've got to catch up now. Yes, I do that, plough on. And it, it, people find that very irritating. That's good. But I think that's, I just plough on. When you direct noises off like that. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, what a great idea. Noises I'd love to see your production of noises. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I only do despair. I don't, anyway, I don't know how to do comedy. It's another art form. And I, I think it makes me feel a bit ill of comedy. <laughs> why, why do you want to do that, you know? What's the point of that? But, but some people are really good at it. And 
And a society's got to have a huge spectrum of cultural offerings, you know. Cool. Got to go from like deep, dark despair, like you and I not wanting people to laugh, yeah. right the way through to, you know, fantastic com comedy, you know. I think that the danger maybe of this cultural environment is it does like the other end of the spectrum quite a lot. Yes, it does. So it finds it difficult sometimes to open up to other possibilities of theatre making or thinking about theatre. Mm. And if I may as well, because I think we've both been in this conversation about are you doing the play properly? You know, like is is it is it the proper version? And you know, and people sort of apparently people when they buy the book of the, the version, that's how I say, but is it is it this one or is it the proper yeah. one? And you think, well, the proper one's in Russian, you fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you want the proper one, you need to learn to read Russian. But it is, it's, a, it's a very weird sort of thing here, socially. It doesn't exist in other countries. There's a sort of, there's a, this idea of doing the play. Um, right. And what that really means, we know what that means, it means a cautious interpretation of the material. Yes. Okay, so it's sort of cautious and one that chimes with the production history of the classic play. That, that's, you know, and, and, you know, we're probably on a cross the end of the spectrum, which is nowhere near as radical as Germany, no, no. where we're doing slightly more decisive interpretation. Mm -hmm. But then there's a huge spectrum of really extreme radical work. You know, in uh, the Shabu now, I remember I went to do um, Miss Julie, and we had period costumes. And Thomas Ostermeyer, he said, I'm going to have to sit down because I'm feeling very ill. I said, oh, Thomas, why do you think so ill? And he said to us, I have run this theatre for 14 years and I've never had a period costume. <laughs> I've done all of, you know, all of Chekhov, all of the and Masters of Shakespeare, the idea that you would have period costume. Mm. So probably what we're doing is probably quite tame by the standards of the German. How do you feel about those productions? Uh, and and Chekhov it pertains, I think, particularly strongly. It's sort of the, the, the syrup sticks very, very hard to the bowl with Chekhov in that. Everyone knows about the linen jackets and the silver birches and the samovar. Like th that, that outline feels like it's on it and sharp. Mm -hmm. I mean, ha the thing you just said very generously about you know uh, everyone's allowed a whole spectrum of culture and there's lots of different ways to skin the cat. Do you feel like that about those productions of classics? What that we should that that they're okay and that they should. I mean, and I say that partly because I don't think I do. I sort of feel like it's it's. The 15 year old in me goes, they're just boring. Like, it's, it, it, they're, they're a dead way of doing great material. Yes, and no. It's a, it's a bigger conversation about what you think the function of what we do is. It's a mm. broader function in society, mm. you know, what it's about. And obviously, you and I probably don't think, although I couldn't necessarily put thoughts into your head, don't probably see the function of what we do as, you know, philosophically, morally, politically, you know, feeding into the society. Uh, other types of productions which you're talking about are provided, I think, for people to escape from society. So people just want to just have some time out. And when they come to pieces of work which are radical, they don't want to have time in on life still. They want the time out. Yeah. So they do tend to get upset. Whether those things should exist or not, mm. I don't think I could be the purveyor of any truths. Mm. I, I think different sections of the community in different countries have different needs from culture, from mm. theatre. Um, and I think the full spectrum should be provided. I think it's dangerous when there is a sort of insistence on one solution and one way. And mm. maybe the reason we muck a bit mm. is because there is a sense that there is one way of making right. theatre. And, and quite a lot of very powerful people, predominantly men, enforce that That's right. system. Um, so it's great that you're male having this conversation. That's super. Um, they force it, and and that that feels a bit. Oof, that feels a bit uh, too much, really. I don't know why they need to enforce it, um, and why they find other ways of looking at it uh, slightly unnerving or wrong. And there are rights and wrongs and goods and bads, aren't mm. they? Well, I think as well. This is this is a, a feeling that that among those sort of, I mean, whatever you would call them, kind of watch people over, over how plays should be done. Yeah. And it feels like a particularly lively battle at the moment. Is a sense that, and I suppose that my, I'm just gonna pick at that thing about comedy a little bit further. I sometimes wonder if the reason I make so much work that's just miserable is because if, if you're going to do something radical, which is what I like because it means 
back to the root, you know, it's kind of going deeper rather than adding, is that the accusation is always, but you've done something to it, or you've kind of overwritten the cake or something. As if what, what you're trying to do when you direct a play like that is not to reveal it, but to cloud it, or to take it away from itself. And I suppose, I, I feel often in, in, in the sort of productions of classics we're talking about and sort of aspiring to, there's also somewhere in the ether a claim that this is serious and this is proper. And as a result, very few of the directors that I look at and think that's the kind of work that I enjoy going to make funny work. Because actually, you have to kind of bang the drum of going, it is okay to try and create a live, now contemporary version of this old text. Because that's what the writers would have wanted. And, and you know, I, I know, I mean, he's a man, but Shakespeare, when you look at that one weird drawing, the Petrie drawing of Titus Andronicus, they're doing it in Elizabethan dress, not in Roman dress. So clearly the gesture of that historical period was to say, they're about now. Like, notionally, they may be, the characters are called other things, and they belong to some other time period, but they look and they feel like right now, otherwise, what are we all doing together in the same room, talking to them? Um, and I suppose I, I wonder whether there's a, I wonder whether someone's going to find a way of opening the door to comedy in, in these sorts of productions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, does, isn't there a, a guy called, what's it, Hermanus who does that, who does fantastic comedy productions? So he's, I can't remember which country he's from, is it it's in Lithuania? Well, and he finds yeah. amazing, well, <coughs> isn't he is very big in, in is that Latvia. 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 Latvia, yes, and he's, he finds a way of doing these plays. So he did, I can't remember, was it a check off or something in fat suits? Everyone was in fat Amazing. suits. And it was really good. And he found a way of sort of angling round. Mm. Is that right? I don't know what the production was, it was in Cologne. And I thought, oh, good on you. Good on you. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> um, but yes, it's, it's a big question, isn't it, about um, what's allowed and what's not allowed? Because um, it's sort of nice to feel like. Maybe you should do the comedy. First. Maybe you just have like, just take a jump. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's next, yeah. Yeah, no, that's next. Maybe it really isn't next, given what you're doing next, which I don't think I can say. But um, <laughs> dark, 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 dark. <laughs> I just, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's, it's, no one likes to feel like they're in some way uh, formed by the form and pressure of the culture and the times and the people who say, well, you can't, or here's how I reacted to that. And then. I just, yeah, that comedy question is for that, you just go, are we being, are we reacting against harder than, you know, in some ways? Because, of course, that conversation, however much you'd like to try and keep it out, <laughs> of course, bleeds in. Even in just in, 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 as you meet actors and they come in and do things and you think, what on that page encourages that? <laughs> do you know yeah. what I mean? And what is the that that you don't like? When... In Chekhov, it was funny, posh voices. That was the thing I really, people kept doing it like it was opera. And I kept being like, but it's it's just ordinary speech, and they'd say, yeah, yeah. Like, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and you just think, but that nobody talks like that. Yes. And and he's taken the trouble to write it in the way that people talk, and so why don't we just do it like that? <laughs> yeah, but you're very kind, see, because you also rewrote it. Yes. So that's it. So you you you're sort of being very kind in getting what you want. I should have thought of that. That was a good idea. You rewrote it, and therefore you've already half directed it, haven't you? Yes. And we sort of naturalised it completely, which is great. It's a very, very kind solution. I'm surprised you weren't attacked more. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I got that on the last one a little bit. I think I, I took some of those bullets the previous time when I read it. Yeah. I got a bit of it on the old one as well. Yeah. Um, but it's also, it's also for me about wanting to meet, in, like as near as possible, to sort of meet the actual text. Mm -hmm. So like I, I worked on the Greek when I did the Greek, and I worked on the Russian when I did this, because I wanted to try and get... Uh, one of the ways for me of trying to scrape off all of that performance history is to try and look at the bones of the artefact mm -hmm. as closely as possible and say what is actually there. Yeah, I did that too. Yeah. You have to. You have it's to. Really important. It's a heart and it, it's all much more, it's less smooth isn't it? Original Chekhov. It's choppy. It's much choppy. Yeah. It's fragmented and it's, he's really trying to capture a very, very precise sort of lifelike tone and quality. Mm. It's really, really choppy. And it's very hard to x-ray. It's like... Mm. To understand exactly what's going on at any given moment. It's easy to interpret, but to really get, you know, to find out what it is. Yeah. And then work out what you're going to do with that data. What is motivating the character? Where does the, you know, scene change and shift? It's, 
oh, I hate it. I hate doing that bit of check off. I go, I just put that off. Analysis of the text. I'll just do some more historical research. Oh, I just yeah. <laughs> and then, then the moment comes. The rehearsals are coming, aren't they? Yeah. You've got to yeah. analyse it and look at the structure, and it's just difficult. It's so difficult. I found it quite rigid like that. A, I, I did things in my hustle for this that I've never done on a classic before. I remember one woman saying to them, yeah, you can try that if you want, but it definitely won't work and it'll just be a waste of time. So we should do it this way around. But I found there was very, very little flexibility in it, mm. psychologically. Like, he was so clear. But that's very good to say, isn't it? Because you know what you're going to say is. But I mean, in, oftentimes I find in, in Shakespeare or in Ibsen, because the, they're sort of somehow made out of bigger bricks and there's more space between them, there's more room for actors to do very, very different things. I've never done Shakespeare. I've done it once. I'm going to do Shakespeare. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> really difficult. Noises off rather than Hamlet, then. Yeah. But, I would yeah. say definitely. Definitely noises off instead of Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> Although we joked at me because I, I am going to do my German show, Ophelia's Zimmer, which is, um, I, at last, I've done my show about Ophelia, you know. If you want to know how awful it is to be a Ophelia, come to that show. <laughs> <laughs> nothing happens, she does nothing, she just gets trodden on and dies. It's <laughs> 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 great, it's great. You can only make it in German. Actually, no, it's a co production with David Well, of course, she's great. <laughs> I did it, and we're going to come and do it in German. Wow, it's amazing. It is amazing, it's amazing at the Royal Court. I think mm. real um, imagination, but we, we're, we're off. We should be. Bang on, check off, shouldn't we? We've won. So, we have. so we, 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 we haven't quite answered the question which I asked a bit earlier. Yeah. I think we got I hijacked it by going onto a gender territory, which is naughty. Um, which was, if, if it's not going to be the three sisters, which is going to be your next check off? I don't know. I mean, it, it, I, one of the reasons I did this was because I knew I could land of those principal roles, people who I thought were really exciting. And, and the idea of going into a rehearsal room on this material with, with, with actors you felt you had to disguise or kind of just like get them to stand in front of the crack so you could take the photograph, I just, I just never wanted to do it. And I always knew that I wanted to meet this feeling like I had an A-team on the field. Mm. And, and I just knew with some of the principals, because of other conversations I'd had that, I had a good chance of being able to do it. Um, and I suppose I, I'd feel that too about doing, and we were talking about this before as well a little bit, that, that in some ways you've, you've kind of had it, which is the, the thing that I really want, which is a, a, an ensemble and a group of actors with whom you have long-term relationships over several shows who you collaborate with again and again and again and again, and sort of, you don't have to start completely on a blank piece of paper. And, and I suppose for me it's so actor-heavy, this material. Like, it's so, it just, I suppose, really simply in that all of the big events happen inside one of the characters. There's never a, a wrecking ball and then the smashes through the set, and, and, or you know, there's never the bit where there's the shooting and everybody dies and then the next characters take over. So actually in terms of plot, there's very, very little to direct. You're only really directing, I felt, actors. Yeah, psychology. And if you haven't got actors who can do that or carry that or execute in, that in a way to make it sing, I imagine it would just... Can we think very differently about that? Really? Yeah, yes. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't not do something because I didn't think I could find the axis. That wouldn't be. It wouldn't be an inhibitor. I would just go. Well, someone will be able to act it. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. that, it's, it's, the thing that would worry me was not knowing how, why I was doing it and what the rules of of it were. You know, that that would worry me much more. The mm. conceptual issues more than casting issues. It's so interesting. Can, can I start on them? It seems that we've opened the floor to we questions. Can <laughs> 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 someone just tell me what time it is, just so we know vaguely how long we've got? 6.42. 6.42, so we have 18 minutes to do some questions. Mine's quick. Okay. When you snip Chekhov, yes. um, what, what informs your decision in the snipping, in the editing? For me, for me, it was really What's easy. Chekhov? Yeah. Chekhov is informing it. Yes. Well, for me, it's, it's twofold. One, what was the experience he wanted his audience to have? So not just like, what was he trying to write in terms of historicity and melodrama and the stage, the stage world he worked in, but what is the experience he wanted the other humans in the room to have? And is there stuff in there now that fights against that? 
So for me, I felt very clearly that this was... Somebody said it to me, actually, and I've stolen it because I like it so much. Big Brother as reimagined by Lars von Trier. Um, <laughs> voyeuristic, emotional, deeply psychological, but also kind of ordinary in a very particular way. Yeah. So I felt that if someone was going to talk about the, the horseshoes that they were using, or you know, say something very specific about history, immediately you, the audience, were let off the hook because you were suddenly talking about something that wasn't about you and was about them or them or otherness. And, and for me, that was the snips. I've, I've actually caught hardly anything. Um, there's, there's probably, I would guess, about 15, 16 lines of... of I, mean, well, I, I, I approve of off-snipping. I, I think perhaps some of Shakespeare could be snipped as well. Off well it has, it has to be, yeah. Um, what, 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 would it, what would encourage you to cut? What, where would you go? Check off. Yeah. Do you have to go to the you have to labour looking at all the literal translation for hours and hours and hours, just trying to work out what he means? And then I think taking off the stuff that is old-fashioned theatrical conventions that are still stuck in there, yes. and just weeding it out so that you leave, lay bare the radicalism, because we're after the event. We're sort of, you know, end of the century. Mm. So we, we don't need to have those conventional signposts. We can just take them out. I think as well that for the... But we don't cut very much. I only cut about 10%. It was with Martin, worked with Martin Cook, we only cut about 10% of the scene off. And there was opera, wasn't there, about that, at the time I remember? It's a great version. No, I believe we're so thorough. Yeah. So close to the Russian, it's unbelievable. It is. Even, even in rhythm, even yeah. in sort of, that, that play has a very particular <laughs> stilted rhythm, doesn't it? Kind of bumpy and utterance. Yeah. Um, but that's part of the conceptual, when we, when we, I suppose, talk about conceptual framework, that's one of the ways I understand that is when it is dead wood and you want to make it green shoots again, hopefully what concept is about is how are you reframing that bit of time travel? That's right. So how do you carry the, the feeling the across the years? That's right originally, because they are radical, historical artefacts. Mm. Very radical. And they're a bit tired, they get a bit tired here, can't they? That's right. Sort of also, that there's a way we do them, and, and that means you don't see them clearly, because mm. if you do it every Christmas, you stop realising it's a thing you're doing. And, you know, the things you do at Christmas dinner every year are things, perhaps, that you memorialise rather than remember. And I think so much theatre, in terms of production of classics, can suffer exactly the same. Yes, yeah, I agree. Floor's closed. Hello. Uh -huh. um, with that in mind, Professor Rob, I really admire your, your version. I, I like to be called him John, Johnny. <laughs> and I, I read, remember reading that to a Russian, Yad Yadanya is not just Johnny, but has an assonance that's slightly childish. And the proper translation might be Unky Bunky. Yes. Because it has to rhyme. And it has to have the same vowel. Yeah. yeah it, it's, it's called Dede Vanya, isn't it? Yeah, Dede Vanya, yeah, yeah. 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 Which is, a, which is a, a nickname for uncle and a nickname for Johnny. Bumpa, bumpa, yeah. Did you, did you consider calling it Uncle Johnny? I did, and I considered calling it, I considered calling him um, Unky Vanky, and lots of similar, for exactly that reason. What I couldn't find was, it, it's not that strong a rhyme to a Russian, apparently. It's a slight rhyme, it's, it's less than a half rhyme. So the effect of Dede Vanya is not as strong as... Onky Johnny or something, and Onky felt American. So I sort of I wrestled with that for ages and ages and ages and ages. I mean, John felt, but John was very very simple because, of course, Ivan in the Russian is the most contemporary. Is it's a really ordinary name, and if you went to do a class of kids now in Russia, probably there'd be lots of Ivan. But you know, when, uh, there was an amazing woman called Constance something who did the early Chekhov. Garnet. <coughs> Garnet, yeah. Yeah, and she right. changed. She anglicised a lot of the names. So that was going on in the twenties and thirties. That's right. And it's sort of it's so interesting, isn't it? There was that that, that huh. intervention, and it sunk back, yeah. and then you sort of re-established it, which is great, isn't it? But it's interesting. I've got to say it again. It was a woman who did it. <laughs> 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 just, just to notice, because it's a very important historical thing. Well, his, his his names are really meaningful. I felt, and and the other thing about the idea that word for uncle is it's also I was told the word that a child would use to address like a policeman in the street or something. As in, oh, sir, can you help me? They'd say, dear, dear, uncle. So it, it makes him ordinary. But of course, the other thing I felt was I'd never seen, I mean, I, well, anyway, I'd never seen it, but I'd never realised before that Vanya is in fact a nickname, not a name. Ivan Vanya. And that if I called him John and Johnny, which is his mother calls him Jean in the Russian as well, that was the only way of carrying that bit of meaning. And it felt like that was part of the job of translating it to say, well, the number of people who speak Russian will be fine with that information and they'll know anyway. But for the rest of us, it would be lovely to try and receive it in as full a form as possible. Were you criticised for that? 
Uh, I, I don't read them, so I don't know, but yes, I imagine so. They're so interesting. They make me so angry and unpleasant, though. They make me so horrible to be around when I've read them. Um, <laughs> because it's either way, either you, you're, you're really sort of delighted, but more likely you go, that's so stupid, like but you, you just don't. you can forensically examine them, and sometimes you find that they reveal fault lines in what you've made. <laughs> sometimes they're quite useful to actually analyse. You go, oh, fuck. The reason that they got so grumpy was actually because I just angled a scene in this way yeah. and therefore it wasn't as cleanly directed as it could be. So sometimes there's there's little data mm. in the toxicity of this <laughs> collection of reviews that's very, very useful. So it's, it's worth it, it's worth it, you know? I might do, I might, I might do it afterwards. Um. Do it as an exercise on your next show. Yeah. So just say, this next show I'm going to lay them all out. I'm going to analyze them. Where's the consistent things and where's the inconsistent things and is there anything useful? And see whether you can, how you take that mm. to change a bit of work. It's quite interesting intellectually. I tend to, and I then they stop offending you. Yeah. There's well, I, I, tend to, I try and do a thing on, on, usually on press nights or the final preview where I write my own and I sit and I, and I write <laughs> down all the things that I think have gone wrong. And if I was forced to kind of like... You need to write them down. Point a gun at it and sort of go... Well, yeah, but like, yeah, I actually want it on a document. Um, partly for that reason, so you can yeah. kind of go, where has this failed? You know, where is this... Uh, is, that's you. interesting. That's very good. Um, ask us more questions. Hello. Just, uh, on that note, Katie, you mentioned that you were somehow disappointed with your production of the Cherry Orchard, and I wondered if, if it's possible to articulate why and, and, and if you would go about it differently. Um... I think I've been away for a long time, and I've come back in, and I was sort of uncertain who I was making the show for. So I've been, um, been in mainland Europe, making a very radical work, and I, and I sort of came back in, and I still, uh, I, I didn't know who the audience was. So I think I should have done what I did with Cleanse, which is make it for the Germans. Which <laughs> I've just, just been totally radical. But I didn't, I thought, oh God, there's the British people who are going to get very angry. What do I do for them? You know? I just got sort of lost, and so I didn't really focus the material. Although I, I, I say that, I have to say very importantly, that all of my colleagues, both in the creative team and the wonderful uh, actors, were, were tremendous artists, so the failures are entirely mine in that piece of work, not theirs, that so they did really, really beautiful. And what is that, what is that, what does the British people's version look like? Like, what, what, what is the calibration there? Um... How to say that? that? There's something about there's something about post-war German culture makers and cultural watchers that's slightly more 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 intellectually alert. They're more the the formal junkies. They don't trust linear narrative, character, anything, and they're interrogating everything. So it's really hard to make work for them. Mm -hmm. It's like sort of being uh, they just sit up and they're watching you like that all the time. Everything. Does it make sense intellectually or not? I'm not sure about that. <laughs> and it's like, and, it's um, like a bright idea of an audience that, that it, well, evaluate, 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 evaluate. Well, it's a bit scary. Yeah. But, uh, it was a bit scary. And so I think with the British audience, though, there's a huge spectrum of uh, different groups yes. in British audiences. They're not, they don't tend to be one general direction. So you do have the old fashioned people who are going to write rubbish, rubbish, rubbish in your program on every page. That happened to you, didn't it? It did, yeah. And, and someone, uh, in pink. Tell that story, please. No, it's just like the seagull that we just sent. It was, there was no letter, it was just a program, and on every page they've written rubbish with pink. <laughs> 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 that, that was very interesting. So it's, it's a much broader spectrum, yeah. and, the, and the people who control the culture um, tend to be white male middle class men, and they have, they have a very, a lot of them have very particular ways of uh, giving it marks and scoring it. Yeah. And talking about it, so um, it's, it's just a very particular. It's just very different. I'm, I'm not saying one is better or worse than the other. They're just very different. And I got very confused about which one I was making <laughs> the show for, and therefore I angled it in a very uh, a slightly confused way. And I didn't really quite get the play. But those things happen, don't they? They really do. After 70 shows, you find out that's what <laughs> that is. You know? <laughs> yes. Hello. Hang on. Um, the, 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 I'm just gonna, the people who put their hands up, I've got to go for first, so let's yeah, let you go on. thank you. Keith, I wanted want to ask you, you said that it's so hard to X-ray uh, Chekhov's um, text, and I'm, I am Russian, so reading it originally, I know it's very heightened 
and paint it in a way, and it's so hard to grasp what you want to say. And in England, the five, I understand him more than when I read in Russian. Um, but my question, when you work, you, you say that uh, you read an original. What about actors? Do you give them, them just adaptation, which you decided to work on? Or do you ask them to read check of an original? Oh, I went through well? that. No, it's so hard to act yeah. that you just got to get going. And to, to spend textual detail work like that, I mean, they'd all go slowly mad. Yeah. I, I think I, I, you, they have to trust that we, as directors, have done that thoughtful yes. work and just stand by the decisions we've made because it, it, it becomes an awful trade of different versions of interpretation and it sort of wastes their creativity. Yeah. Because actors are sort of brilliant at acting, <laughs> you know, and, but do sustained analysis is a way of sort of killing their imagination slowly. And then, they, and then they can't build because they've been shifting around what they're going to say for so much time, they can't actually build the character. So I think I always want to see you just, you just write a contract, don't you? You say, okay, for better or for worse, I've made these decisions. Mm. We haven't got much time, so let's stand by them and, and do the best with these decisions. And you can always say to them, you know, it's only one show, it'll be over pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be other directors, other versions of yeah. it, other things, you know. It's, it's only a little sort of drop in your life. So you try and get to sign the contract in the moment with those types of theories. And then you hopefully move forwards. And you hope, you pray, you pray, you really pray. They don't come in with other editions yeah. of the play. <laughs> with highlight pens and start to negotiate. You really pray, don't you? Do. Well, but partly because I think some for, for, for it just wastes time. I, well, I think for so many others as well. You, part of the game is to is to see to see if you can get them to be so confident that they'll say it like they've just thought of it. Mm -hmm. And so that what you hours. it takes hours and, and 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 a lot of heart and soul and work and work and work. It's really hard to act check. We really hard. No, we have really it. really hard to act check on. And the last thing I suppose I wanted was for them to feel how actually honestly quick sandy the textual world is, yeah. and, and, and like a tiny, tiny pronoun change or something in Chekhov makes a huge difference. And often there are things like the title of this play that you can't translate perfectly. So you're always making a trade-off somewhere and saying, well, I think, I think the, the sort of banality of it is more important than the rhyme. And I've made that call. But of course, if we had like a Russian-speaking actor in the room, I mean, we could definitely use them yeah. to find out things in the Russian. Of course. That would be useful. Of course. It yes. Is. I suppose it's just it's trying to protect the actors from the sea of, 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 of chaos that is the pre pre rehearsal process, isn't it? That's right. Um, yeah. And we're control freaks, so obviously we don't. <laughs> want to um, I can't really see up there, but I think we're just. Can I ask a question? Well, yeah, we're going to take one yeah. more question. Yeah. Um, about timing. Uh, it's interesting because you gave you have experience from Russia, uh, the continent, and uh, Britain, and I. There is this old notion of that uh, a Chekhov play would be running for like two and a half hours here in England, and for each time zone, if you jump eastwards, you would add another hour. Uh, and maybe that goes for the rehearsal process as well. If you have very little time to rehearse here, you get more and more time uh, the farther east you get. that. I, th I think that's, uh, that's true, but, but I, I haven't noticed huge differences actually in rehearsal periods available in Germany, France, and Britain. But I haven't, I haven't uh, directed anything in Moscow, so maybe you can get many, many more weeks. I don't know. I don't know. <coughs> but, well, you were get, you were asked to go to Moscow. You should mm. go. You should try it out. Go, come back and tell us what it's like. Yeah, <laughs> you try know. for 16 weeks yeah. rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> See what it's like. Although the RSC rehearsed for a long, long, long time. Yeah, but you have to share the actors with other people. So it doesn't really count. You only get about two days. Yeah. <laughs> so it just sort of, it all looks really nice, but actually you're sharing. Um, I'll just we'll take one very, very final question and then we'll better let them come into play. Hello. Just, just hello. Something that uh, I find with Chekhov is that there's this innate Russianness that, that is very difficult to capture when you're not Russian. Um, I had the great privilege of seeing Chekhov in Moscow at that kind of theatre. And one of the reasons in Russian, and language aside and history aside, there's this innate Russian soul and passion that comes through when it's performed that, that's very difficult to capture. But we can't, ca I don't think we can yeah. capture it because we're not Russian. Okay. That was, that was and, and a very, very particular history and society is, is different. So we can take the pressure off. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We really appreciate what they do there. And then our, 
efforts may not be as good, yeah. but we can still make those efforts. And I thought about you know watching War and Peace. Yeah. I watched War and Peace on the telly. Oh no, this is going to be a catastrophe. But it actually wasn't. The bits of it were a catastrophe. But actually, some of it was okay. You know, some of it was actually. Quite beautiful, I thought. I mean, I'm looking at the, the Russian colleague here. She's the person to take the measurement. <laughs> I think we can, we can, but try. Can't we, we can, but try. And I also think, like with any great play, it's about the hum the humanity of it more than about the geography of it. Mm -hmm. And for me, I felt like you would never, you know, if you were if if you were doing a, a Chinese play, encourage the actors to pretend to be Chinese because that would be seen as weird and, and sort of mildly offensive. And I suppose the idea of, of for me at least, spending the first week of rehearsals going. Let's try and be Russian. Like, what do those strange Russians do? Was just something I never entertained for a second. And partly because, actually, again, Chekhov's experience in Vanya is that it's set in the country, but you're not told where. They speak like the audience would have spoken, the same language, they have the same names. So it's just a play that happens uh, sort of about between the people in the room and, and the Russianness felt. Maybe it's there as a flavour, I don't know. Like, I find it so hard to be general about a huge country full of people. Um, and, and it just it didn't seem like a, a thing, you know what I mean, that, that needed any work of time. She's We're getting away from time, we're going to have to start the <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, it just reminds me to thank you all for coming to thank you. <laughs>